Tristan und Isolde, Wagner's massive telling in music of the medieval tale of a peerless Breton knight and a beautiful Irish princess, begins quietly with a quivering phrase of four notes intoned by the cellos. The last note of that phrase overlaps with another four-note theme which will occur hundreds of times in the opera. Sounded first by the woodwinds, it pushes upwards. Commentators have often called it yearning. When the two themes overlap, they form a chord, the so-called Tristan chord, perhaps the most famous chord in the whole history of music. That first chord of Tristan is famous, even notorious, because Western music for centuries had been conventionally structured on two tonalities, major and minor, and a fixed system of keys. But there is no key signature given the first page of Tristan. It may appear to be in the key of A minor, or possibly A flat minor. But the two amorphous themes give no hint of being in any key, or of belonging to any tonality. And the chord they form, superimposes a perfect fourth, the traditional basis of Western tonality, on an augmented fourth, which the Middle Ages called the Diabolus in Musica, the devil in music, or, in critic Barry Millington's phrase, the agent of anarchy and dissolution. In technical language, the chord is unresolved, as is the other chord that the yearning phrase leads to. We wait for a resolution, and all we get is a long moment of silence. Then the two themes reach higher. And we get another moment of silence. The themes reach higher still. To the same silence, to an anguished repetition, yearning fragments of it. And at last, a wonderful fulfillment. But musically, this is not a resolution at all, for with that sweeping wave of sound, we have pushed through to a new tonality without ever settling ourselves in the one whence we came. Tristan und Isolde is often said to be the greatest of operatic love stories, and Wagner, when he first planned it, wrote to Franz Liszt to say that it would be a monument to the true happiness of love, that most beautiful of all dreams. But even in its first measures, with those almost amorphous and unfulfilled musical statements, we have an indication that the opera became, in the composing, something more than a love story. Musically, 
Tristan may be, as it has been accused of being, the beginning of the disintegration of traditional musical structures that reached its apogee, or, if you like, its nadir, with the dissonant twelve-tone music that characterized much of twentieth-century composition. Certainly the sound of Tristan was, when it was first performed in 1865, something new, torturous, and strange. But its text as well is strangely tortured, unconventional, fragmentary. And both text and music, Wagner insisted, were only means of expression serving the drama, a drama which, in this case, he said was a representation of our human nature. Tristan, based on one of the Western world's oldest stories of romantic love, is filled as well with other passions, more spiritual and also more dangerous and terrifying passions. Ultimately, it is concerned with what Wagner thought during its composing was the human condition, an endless and endlessly unsatisfied yearning, the yearning for an infinity of peace that lies, even for lovers, far beyond the world we know. Music and text together serve an idea about men and women and the world in which they find themselves, an idea that Wagner had felt his way towards and then found to his amazement was already explicated in the metaphysics of his contemporary, Arthur Schopenhauer. It was as if the philosopher had made explicit the intuitions the composer had felt in his own subconscious. Let's play more of the orchestral prelude to Tristan and hear the theme that, in the opera to follow, is associated with the look that Tristan gave Isolde as he lay before her wounded and vulnerable. She stood over him at that moment with a drawn sword poised to kill him and we hear a motif of three notes quietly in the bass line. The ominous motif of death. It is immersed in the pleading theme of the look, for when Tristan's eyes met Isolde's, she stayed her hand, she could not kill him. And it was at that moment in the past that they fell in love. Nowhere more than there is Wagner's version of the story so different from the rest of the Tristan tradition, which has the lovers fall in love when they drink a potion. Wagner, as we shall see, has another, more symbolic use for that potion. Just now you may have the feeling that all of the musical material is growing out of the yearning theme. It is. That four-note motif is beginning its hours of evolutions. A particularly tender variant of it follows. Wagner wrote to Matilda Wesendank that at this point she would hear ivy and vine in the music. A naive comment, perhaps, for the naive young woman Wagner was in love with when he wrote Tristan's first two acts. He was remembering one of his sources that ends when the vine from Tristan's grave branches by night across the chapel where the lovers are buried and reaches to the tomb of Isolde.
Then the music begins to ebb and flow, and as we listen to this classic performance by the Philharmonia Orchestra under Wilhelm Furtwängler, we have the feeling of drifting on the yearning theme as on a sea. The sea is the great image of the first and last acts of this opera. Wagner described the music of the prelude to Matilda as, quote, the ebb and flow of the world's breath. He was reading Buddhist theories of the origin of the world at the time. In his words, the primal cloudless heavens ebb and flow. Swell and condense. Through vast eons of time. Till the visible world is created. At the end of the opera, Isolde sings as that yearning theme swirls around her and then climaxes of drowning in this Welt Atoms Veendem All, in the universal stream of the world's breath. Musical commentators have, I think rightly, called the four-note theme simply yearning. Yearning for an infinity of peace that can never be found in the vast sea that is a human life. That is what Tristan is really about. When the curtain rises, we are in the midst of the sea, on the ship captained by Tristan that is bringing Isolde from Ireland to the west coast of England, where she is to be married to Cornwall's aged king, Marca. All is deathly still on shipboard, and from the masthead there floats down the voice of a young English sailor singing to the Irish girl he left on shore behind him. Westward stray the eyes, eastward flies the ship. Fresh blows the wind towards home. My Irish child, where are you now? Isolde starts up in fury, for the words seem to be directed at her. She is an Irish child, abandoned by the one who loved her, Tristan. She calls on the winds to smash his ship and sink it in the waves. But though she has magic powers, the winds do not answer. And as a sail lifts, and the young sailor's voice floats down again from the rigging, Isolde resolves on another, better way to destroy Tristan. She sees him standing on the deck, outlined against the sky, contemplating the sea. She intones the yearning theme, for she still loves him, but concludes, for she hates him too, his head is destined for death, his heart is destined for death. The singer is Kirsten Flagstad.
Tristan has betrayed Isolde. That is why he has refused on the sea voyage to look at her and she to speak with him. Now, in a famous narrative, Isolde tells us what has happened. Sometime before, her betrothed, the Irish hero Morold, sailed to England to exact tribute from Cornwall's king. There he was challenged to single combat by the king's nephew, the valiant Tristan. Morold dealt Tristan a deadly blow, but Tristan emerged the victor. Cruelly he hacked off Morold's head and sent it back to Ireland in place of the demanded tribute. But she, Isolde, found in Morold's head a splinter of the sword that had severed it, and she kept that splinter hidden, swearing vengeance on the hated Tristan. Meanwhile, the wound that Tristan had received in the duel would not heal. His comrades, thinking he would soon die, gave him a hero's funeral. They sorrowfully set him adrift in a little boat without oars or sail. Fatally, the boat drifted to Ireland, where Isolde, skilled in magic arts, tended the wounded man, not knowing who he was, till she saw a notch in his sword, a notch into which the splinter left in Morold's head fit exactly. The man she was tending was the very man she had sworn to kill. She took Tristan's gleaming sword and raised it over his head as he lay helpless before her. And then, as she tells us, from his sick bed. He looked up. Not at the sword. Not at my hand. He looked into my eyes. His suffering touched me. The sword, I let it fall. I healed the wound that Morold struck and sent him home. So he would torment me no more with his eyes. Tristan headed back to England, restored to health, and swearing his love to Isolde with a thousand oaths. Small wonder then that she was confused, angry, and vindictive when he came sailing to Ireland again, laughing, she says to carry her across the sea to marry her to his uncle, King Marca. Now, in a furious outburst, Isolde curses Tristan, and though she still loves him, vows death for them both.
The serving girl, the faithful Brangaena, has listened to all of this in mounting terror. Isolde sends Brangaena for her magic drafts, reaches for the death potion, and commands the girl to prepare it. At that moment, the crew sights land, and Isolde demands that Tristan come at last to face her. He is too loyal to his king to tell Isolde that he has loved her ever since his pleading look stayed her hand. But he tries, falteringly, to explain to her how, next in line to the throne, he was forced by jealous courtiers, by knightly honor and allegiances, to support the popular clamor that Cornwall's childless king should marry the wonderful Irish princess, who might give him an heir, and so end the war between the two countries. And that is why, torn between love and duty, he has come back to claim her for his king. Tristan knows she hates him for that. He knows why she has summoned him before her now. He is prepared to die. He extends his sword, saying that this time she may drive it through. Instead, she proffers the cup containing the potion. Ceremoniously, he drinks from it. She seizes the cup before he has drained it and drinks too. The cup falls. There is a long silence. The orchestra reprises the opening phrases of the prelude as if the opera were only now beginning. In a sense, it is. On the brink of what they think is death, there is no longer any need to conceal the passion each has felt all along for the other. They stand transfixed, thinking they will die. But strangely, they do not die. Instead, they gaze openly into each other's eyes with the love they had repressed. For Brangaena, or some power greater than Brangaena. Has poured a love potion. Not a death potion. Into the cup. Now Brangaena hurries to tear Isolde from Tristan's arms, and Tristan's faithful servant Kurvena hurries to wake his dazed master to reality. King Marka is approaching to the sound of trumpets to claim his bride. The first act is mostly Isolde's. The last act will be mostly Tristan's. The central act they share. We are in the gardens of Cornwall's royal palace. Evening comes on, and King Marka leaves for a hunt. Isolde exultantly extinguishes the torch that keeps sentinel on the ramparts, and the lovers race into each other's arms, breathless with excitement as they curse the hated light of day and bless the darkness that shelters them alone together. In the frenzied pages that begin their love duet, they sing of light and darkness almost as metaphysical realities, separate and opposed. Schopenhauer had opposed the phenomenal outer world of consciousness where all is unfulfilled yearning with the noumenal inner world of the unconscious where all reality becomes one. The duet, first lit with flashes of daylight brilliance in the orchestra, eventually subsides into a long, quiet hymn to night, 
its main melody derived from the four notes of the Tristan chord. Here again is Kirsten Flagstad with Ludwig Suthaus as her Tristan. The voice of the faithful Brangena, in perhaps the most enchanted music of the opera, comes floating down from the tower where she is keeping watch. Our Brangena is Blanche Thebaum. Take care, take care, the night will soon pass away. Now the lovers, who almost died together in Act I, when, in the glaring sunlight, she was full of hatred and he of despair, begin, in the darkness, to see death in a new way. It could come upon them in the night as a fulfillment of the love they can now no longer control or satisfy. It would dissolve the physical limitations that enflesh them in their separate identities and make them utterly one. Tristan sings, Let us die, and then, watched over by Brangena high above them, the lovers sing together to the most familiar melody in the opera, Let us die together, so that ever and always one we may be united in love forever.
But before Tristan can draw his sword to slay, and so unite them both, Brangaena shrieks from the tower. Day has broken, and Marka enters with his retinue. The jealous courtier Melot, who has set the trap, claims he has saved the king's honor. But Marka, in a long, almost Arthurian soliloquy, is more concerned with lost faith. The two people he loved most in the world have paid him in pain. Joseph Grindel is our King Marka. Then the orchestra reprises the opening measures of the prelude as if the opera were only now beginning. In a sense, it is. Tristan turns to Isolde and asks, Will you follow Tristan to where he goes now, to the realm of darkness? She, knowing he intends to die, quietly says she will. He kisses her. Melot rushes on with his sword and in a moment Tristan, all but impaling himself on Melot's sword, falls wounded into the arms of his faithful retainer, Courvenal. Before we move on to the astonishing final act of this drama, a word about its importance in Western culture. Tristan und Isolde is perhaps the most influential work of art of the past hundred years. We've already indicated that it changed much of 20th century music. Audiences, confused at first, eventually responded to Tristan with wild excitement. Sold out annual performances with Kirsten Flagstad and Lauritz Melchior got them met through the darkest days of the Depression when Tristan led all other works in popularity. This is the act that some of us regard as the greatest in any opera. Tristan has been brought by the trusty Courvenal to the lonely castle in Brittany where he had lived as a child until Orphaned, he crossed the sea to Cornwall to seek knighthood at the court of his uncle, King Marca. Now Courvenal has brought Tristan back, helpless and wounded, to this place where he was born, where the sea stretches, empty and steaming in the sun, as far as the eye can see. Tristan has long lain there unconscious. Somewhere, one of the shepherds on his lands is piping an alta visa, an old melody, perhaps inspired by the cries of gondoliers that Wagner alone in Venice heard echoing through the canals. The shepherd appears on the seawall, and Courvenal tells him, that Isolde has been sent for, to come with her magic arts to bleed Tristan and restore him to life. The shepherd is to play his mournful tune until he sights a ship on the sea. But the shepherd can only say, in a line Eliot used memorably in the wasteland, Waste and empty is the sea. He puts his pipe to his lips once again 
and resumes his watch. As in Act I, the offstage sailor's song awoke Isolde from her shipboard silence, so here the offstage shepherd's tune awakens Tristan gradually from his coma. He lies musing on the strange, dark, wonderful world he has seen in the depths of his unconscious. He tells Courvenal that he has struggled painfully upwards out of unconsciousness to the conscious land of light to find Isolde and bring her with him to that dark, wonderful world where she has promised to follow him. Feverishly, he imagines he sees her ship approaching, only to hear the shepherd's tune float down again from the sea wall. Courvenal says sadly, There is no ship to be seen. Here is Dietrich Fischer Dieskau with that line. Wagner's hero, his memory triggered by the sound of the shepherd's tune, explores his past, how the same Alta Weise hung on the evening air when, as a boy, he first heard how his father died, how it sounded again in the early morning when they told him that his mother had died, giving him birth. The tune, he says, answers the question, Why was I born? With the response, to yearn and to die. Small wonder they named him Tristan, Sadness. As the mournful tune echoes through Tristan's memory, as the relentless sun overhead burns into his brain, he comes to see what his life has been, an endless, painful torrent of yearning. Insatiate yearning, he now sees, is the human condition, inherited from father and mother, nurtured by the ideals of society, intensified by sexual passion, ending only in death. He summons all his strength, rises from his sickbed, and curses the potion that he drank with Isolde, the potion that intensified beyond endurance the yearning that has tormented him from his birth. Then he sinks back as if dead. Courvenal thinks that he has died. But no, the heart is still beating, and Tristan, having renounced the insatiate yearning that his life has been, wakes to a beatific vision of Isolde coming across the sea, walking on waves of flowers, bringing peace.
Suddenly the shepherd's tune quickens and changes, and Courvenal sights Isolde's ship approaching, steering safely through the reefs, its flag flying. Tristan, left alone, tears off his bandages and lets the blood stream from his wound, for Isolde has come to bleed and heal him. He means, of course, to die with him. The torch is extinguished, he cries, as he rushes to meet her. He breathes his last word, Isolde, just as she arrives to take him in her arms. She doesn't understand at first, but then... As if from his dead lips, she hears a wisp of the familiar melody he sang to her in Act Two, Let Us Die Together. She follows him into unconsciousness. She doesn't react when a second ship arrives, and Courvenal is killed, slaying the hated Melot. She doesn't hear Brangaena calling to her, or King Marca saying he now knows and understands everything, and is ready to forgive and unite the lovers. Why should she hear any of this? Her dead Tristan is speaking to her of a wholly different reality. The wisp of melody she hears from his smiling lips expands to what we have always called, since Franz Liszt first gave it the name, the Liebestod, the love death. Can't you see him smiling, Isolde sings? Can't you hear the music he speaks? The whole orchestra, singing for the dead Tristan, sounds and resounds the melody from Act Two, in which he sang to her, Let us die, so that together, ever and always one, never waking, we may be united in love forever. Isolde surrenders to Tristan's orchestral pleading, as if she were walking on, engulfed by, and then sinking in cosmic tides. And as she dies on his body, the restless yearning motif unfulfilled on the first page of the score and a hundred times thereafter, lifts at last to its resolution, washed away in peaceful major chords. Much can be and has been said about this ineffable work. Let me speak briefly about a few of its many levels of meaning. An essential starting point in discussing Tristan is the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer. Wagner declared that his discovery of Schopenhauer's book The World as Will and Idea, at the time he was about a quarter way into composing The Ring, was the most important event of his life. He read it through four times then, and continued to read in it for the rest of his days, notably while completing Tristan in Venice. It was the book that first put Wagner in touch with his own subconscious. For Schopenhauer, the essential principle operating in the world was a blind, irrational force, a restless mass of energy which he called Villa, or Will. 
He saw it operating in nature in irreversible physical laws, in animals as instinct, and in men and women. This, for the pessimistic Schopenhauer, is one of nature's cruelest impositions, as conscious passion, ultimate human wisdom and peace, what Wagner often called redemption, lies in recognizing and renouncing the compulsive villa of the phenomenal world. In Tristan und Isolde, we may see villa as the restless, meaningless sea, meaningless until he renounces his yearning, meaningless until she has followed him. Or we may feel villa in the insistent, incessant piping of the shepherd's unearthly tune, which sums up all the sorrows of Tristan's life and ends only when he has renounced his yearning. Or we may fear villa as the hated, feverish sunlight illuminating the phenomenal world which the lovers reject when together they invoke nocturnal oneness in what Schopenhauer called the noumenal world. Or, overwhelmingly, we can hear villa as the four-note yearning motif pervading the whole world of the opera and finding rest only on the last musical page when the renunciations of both lovers are complete. Wagner was also reading Buddhist writings when he was composing Tristan. The word Buddha means awakened. Only when Tristan, awakened from his desperate relapse, renounces the desire that took hold of him when he drank the potion, is he granted his nirvana vision of Isolde walking across the flowery sea. Only when she follows him into unconsciousness does she wake to the nirvana experience of him singing the orchestral Liebestode. They must extinguish the desire that has brought them pain. The word nirvana means extinguishing. Does Tristan preach Eastern nirvana and Western denial of villa? Is it a realization in art of the original love myth of the Western world? Is it a forecast of the inevitable decline of Western civilization? Is it the ultimate expression of the German romantic soul in love with darkness? Is it a passionate view of death as a return to the true nature of one's being? Is it a realization without recourse to religious traditions of the highest truth of the world's religions? To this listener, Tristan is all of those things. But I'll let Kirsten Flagstad, walking spellbound into cosmic tides as a hundred instruments send her Tristan song surging and bounding around her, I'll let her magisterial voice and the cresting waves of Furtwängler's orchestra tell us in the only proper terms, musical terms, what Tristan und Isolde means. Thank you. 